The, the, parish, the parish I this week is indeed um, Devarim, it's um, the start of Deuteronomy, but I've decided to dedicate um, my address today for a follow-up to my previous discussion last week on whose land. Now, um, I want to make clear that I'm not really trying to sort of teach or get through a message um, today in particular, but I do want to just sort of share with you guys what I've been thinking about and some of the things that have been challenging me. Um, in particular regarding the biblical aspects of sort of relationships to the land and how we should treat people in the land and I guess foreigners in the land too. So um, I wanted just to share some of my thoughts that I was thinking about this week. Again, nothing that I'm saying today is should be taken as teaching. It should be taken as a, with a grain of salt, um, but just some of the thoughts that I've been having as well. So in, in terms of the background, just for those of you who missed last week, I definitely recommend you watch that um, um, the particular sermon, we talked about the land of Israel, the biblical land of Israel. And we used as a springboard last week's double portion at the end of Numbers, Matot Masay. We discussed the potential boundaries or the borders of Israel. We affirmed Israel's right to the land as un you know, unequivocal, completely justified according to the scripture. But we also briefly discussed the need for empathy and consideration for the people already living there. So that's where I really wanted to um, explore this week, what that looks like um, in a modern day. And I guess the question could be asked um, for all this, you know, sure, we need to treat people with respect and empathy, um, you know, as brothers and sisters in the Messiah and also as fellow human beings. But then the commandment also says, um, didn't God command us to drive them out? God did command us to drive out the native inhabitants of the land prior to the Israelites moving there. <clears throat> So I guess um, when we combine all these ideas together, the, um, the, um, the biblical affirmation of Israel's right to the land and also the commandments in, in scripture um, for the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites, it does tend to um, seem to um, quote unquote, seal the deal for Zionism. And I say this as a Zionist myself, and um, what we mean by Zionist is there's so many di different definitions by people who are very anti-Semitic, you know, anti but really what Zionism is, is essentially the idea that the Jewish people um, deserve and need a homeland for, of their own. That's all Zionism is. And I guess these ideas in scripture do tend to seal the deal for us. And I guess um, I've been thinking about, you know, is there a counter argument? Is there, um, or maybe not a counter argument, but is there at least, um, or are there at least some secondary considerations to be made? And um, this week I came across the um, book of Judges and the first three chapters. And I think they are worthy of consideration after our discussion last week. Now, we don't have time this week to read, obviously, the whole three chapters, but I do want to give some context and a brief summary. Also highlight some very interesting passages in, in within those chapters, and we'll discuss them further. So the context of this is um, Joshua, who was the, the first leader of the Israelites after Moses. He has died. He was 110 years old. And um, God continued to give favor to the Israelites to conquer the rest of the land. So there was, um, by this point, the Israelites had conquered most of the land, but not all of it. However, Israel did not complete the conquest. Even though they were strong enough, Israel was more intent on subjugating the Canaanites, so um, making them slaves and serving the Israelites, but did not drive them out fully. And God directly warns Israel against this, and, and he warns that the nations will be a snare for the people. That's the word that's used in the English translations. And what is meant by that is these people would influence Israel to serve their idols, to serve their gods, including the Baals, which were a group of idols that they, they worshipped. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happened. And we read this in the book of um, Judges, chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. Now, um, as a result of this, God withdrew his blessing. Instead of um, Israel being strong and being able to conquer, plunderers and so the bandits started to conquer them and to cause much distress amongst Israel. God um, then heard the cries of the people, and as a result, he raised up judges. That's where the book of Judges, the name comes from. And these were guides and leaders, and they, and, and they were also you know, military as well. So we'll talk about that in a sec. But 
Um, they were essentially leaders to help shepherd Israel. Under them, Israel's condition improved. They returned to God and God's favor will return to the nation. But when they died, they went back into sin, and then Israel's fa- um, you know, Israel lost God's favor, and then they suffered too. So it was a bit of a topsy turvy period. So unfortunately, the consequences for Israel's decision not to drive out the nations had everlasting consequences felt until this day. And we also read that God stopped driving out the nations, and we read this in a couple of places in in Judges chapter two. In verse three, it says, "So now I say." I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your side. And in verses 21 to 22, it says, I will no longer drive them out before, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died, in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. We actually read that God causes the nations to stay in the land. So it's actually by God's power that these nations stay. In Judges chapter 3. Now, these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites, and the Sidians and the Hevites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from, from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Levo Hamat. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether God would to, to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which He commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So we can see here that the, there's actually a divine presence that God sort of started to use the, the nations for to sort of test Israel. Despite all this, God was still sympathetic to the cries of Israel when they wept, and He sent multiple deliverers in the form of His judges. In chapter three of the book of Judges, we read about three judges um, in this chapter alone. We read about Othniel. Um, Othniel was Caleb's nephew. We read about Ehud and we read about Shamgar. So they were not only spiritual um, sort of rabbinic, not really rabbinic leaders, but sort of like, you know, spiritual leaders, of course, but they also had a military role. So they were dual um, spiritual and military leaders, and they actually often would lead armies to subdue Israel's enemies. And through Othniel, um, the land had peace for 40 years. If, um, I'm just re- referencing Judges 3, verse 11. And so he was a very, very successful judge um, and actually helped Israel um, enter a time of peace and prosperity. So how can we apply this knowledge? We see on, on, on one hand, we have God's commandment to drive out the nations and to conquer the land and, and possess it. But then we have, um, you know, I guess a, a, as a result of Israel's, um, I guess, um, less than enthusiastic approach to doing that, God then says, no, um, I'll keep these nations in the land and they will test you. So how can we sort of apply this self seeming paradox? Well, there's been many different um, perspectives on this, and I will um, talk about two main ones. Um, The first one is, um, this is sort of the more right-wing, I guess, um, stance. Um, Not to say whether it's good or bad, it's just it's um, a fact it's the more right-wing stance. Um, Some people say that this should be a further reminder for us that we should not make the same mistakes of our ancestors. And we should actually use this as motivation to actually further fully drive out the non-Jewish inhabitants. And um, and people who have sort of thought like this in the past, have, I'm not sure if you guys would have heard, there was a, a rabbi, uh, he died about uh, about 25 years ago, just maybe just before or after I was born. Um, his name was Rabbi Meir Kahana. And he um, was an American rabbi originally, but he um, moved to Israel and he ran for Israeli parliament. And his um, ideology was... Um, again, it's nothing that um, he hasn't said himself. His ideology was that it was impossible to be, for there to be a, a, a successful Jewish state when there were significant minorities in the land. And I guess that goes against the, the idea of multiculturalism. And Israel is very multicultural today. So he was very um, unpopular um, amongst the general population. But he did have a um, maybe 15, 20 percent of the population did have strong support for him. And he would sort of fall into this view. He would say that. You know, we should learn from the past. We should learn that, you know, Israel always struggled when, you know, other nations were allowed in, and therefore we should drive out the nations. We should, you know, make it a completely Jewish state, 100%. And he's, he actually proposed um, um, to essentially expel the Arabs from Israel. That was his proposal. He, nothing that he didn't say himself on, 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 that you can see online. So um, it's interesting because, you know, that's a very controversial example. But if you actually... 
um, take the scriptures, you can actually get to that perspective if you take a certain spirit. So we'll return back to the slides. Um, so that's that's one particular example. So um, and I guess um, the um, spiritual justification for this is that you can sort of see from the history of Israel that the nations did indeed cause Israel to fail the test. So the nations did indeed cause Israel to serve idols. They influenced um, Israel to you know commit idolatry. And really, really not only idolatry, but also adopt some of the detestable worship practices of the nations. So like sacrificing children to idols was a, um, a practice that they did. And Israel, unfortunately, adopt, adopted that practice too. And we can see here that God was not commanding ethnic cleansing for its own sake. Um, it's often a criticism of um, Bible believers that we serve a God who ethnically cleansed the Canaanites. Now, um, of course, um, th there is no way to... Um, you know, look at this any other way, like the, the commandment to drive out the Canaanites is indeed ethnic cleansing. I'm not denying that. But God was not doing it just because he hated the Canaanites. Like he actually um, does the same thing to Israel. Whenever Israel sinned enough to be expelled, actually God expelled the Israelites from the land too. So it was very even handed. God actually um, caused Abraham's descendants to, um, you know, the, the children of Israel to be slaves in Egypt because one of the nations in the land did not deserve yet to be driven out. So God is very just and he's very even handed. He doesn't have favorites. So I don't think we should sort of, you know, be caught into this whole this debate about oh, God is an ethnic cleanser. He's, he um, maintains that the land is holy and will only accept a holy people. And if the people are not holy, then they get driven out. It's not because God wants to ethnically cleanse the land, but that's just because in his land, there needs to be a holy people, whether it is a Jew or a non-Jew. And unfortunately, Israel does get corrupted with pagan influence. And as a result, the land drives them out too. And we can see this as a continuous issue for Israel right until the exiles. And um, going back to the thinking of Meir Kahana and, and sort of people like him, that this line of thinking would sort of, um, sort of reinforce in their minds that they had to get rid of all other influences from the land. So that would mean completely expelling you know, um, the Arab populations in the land, Jew, uh, you know, Christian or Muslim, and reclaiming as much land as possible. So that would be their thinking. However, we must understand that God has now permitted these nations to stay. So that's an important point because it's not just that they were just there begrudgingly because oh, Israel didn't do their job. They actually were allowed to stay. And Rashi, in his commentary on chapter three in the book of Judges, he actually specifically mentions that they were permitted to stay. It wasn't that they were just like left over. So, and they were permitted to feel the divine to, to test Israel to see if they would obey God and hold fast to him. So that's very, very important to consider as well. <clears throat> so we'll um, move on there. Um, oh, to the previous, back to the previous slide, please, uh, Michelle. Um, now, uh, I will mention that even in the Jewish, in the, um, in the Jewish commentaries, that um, when, the, when the Messianic era comes, the, the whole ball game when it comes to the land changes. Like we're not exactly sure what will happen. There's different um, opinions, but um, until then, um, we sort of have this understanding that the other nations, according to Rashi, do have a purpose in the land. And it should, it should be noted that even throughout Israel's times with, of prosperity and strength, for example, under King David, when they were conquering lands all over the place, they didn't conquer the full um, sort of promised land. They sort of conquered other lands too. And they were never commanded to drive out the Canaanites again. That never, like, that commandment was sort of um, superseded in a way by this understanding that the, the nations would be in the land. Now, I will move on now to the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are a very interesting um, discussion. They were one of Israel's most persistent enemies. <laughs> they were definitely at odds with Israel uh, throughout their history. Um, if you remember, the, in, later in the book of Judges, um, Samson, the super strong guy who was a Nazarite, he, um, you know, many of his great battles were against the um, against the Philistines. And if you also can recall, so Samson was not only a physically strong military leader, but also was a judge, so a spiritual leader too. So this sort of shows the dual function. But anyway, so um, the Philistines' territory, we actually are told in Joshua 13, um, verse 3, they have five cities. And these five cities can actually be found in modern Israel today. So I've drawn the map here and I've sort of, um, this is obviously the land of Israel, um, sort of the center of Israel. And we can see the five cities. So we've got Gaza to the southwest, we've got Ashkelon, Ashdod on the coast, and inland you've got Ekron and Gath or Gut. And these places all exist today. And they were actually 
Um, that was roughly the territory. So there were the five cities of, of, of um, the Philistines. So I've just sort of circled here a rough outline of what the territory is. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a big territory, but it was essentially roughly sort of the southern coast of Israel slash Gaza. So, you know, similar to um, that territory today. Now, I've included an interesting question at the bottom of the slide. Are they, are they the ancestors of today's Palestinians? Now, the answer is we don't know for sure. Who knows? That's the, that's the answer. Um, I don't think it really matters um, whether they were or not because the um, – I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why, for two reasons. Firstly, um, they themselves are claiming that – I mean, not 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 so explicitly, but, but implicitly by claiming the land that they're claiming, they are claiming sort of at least a um, – spiritual in a sense legacy i mean of course um you know the philistines were not arabs uh, as far as we know and um obviously the palestinians are um are descended from arabs as well so again but those distinctions are not really that relevant because um the palestinians by claiming the land that they're claiming they are claiming that legacy in a way and also the second reason is is when we excuse me when we think about it um the like i mean if we use that standard, as in the standard that you have to prove your ancestry, um, you know, you know, with documentation, with to the point, it becomes a very difficult ball game because, like, for example, there are many Jews, obviously, who are obviously claim um, Jewish ancestry, and the promises of the land of Israel are, um, in some ways, ethnic promises because it's to Abraham's descendants. And if you think about, it, if we if we as Jews had to claim an unbroken line back to Abraham, we would find it very difficult. So I think it's very dangerous to get into this game of, oh, you're having to prove, you know, having to prove it unequivocally that you're descended from these people. If they're claiming that um, sort of um, lineage and descent, of course, there's obviously some claims which are sort of more ridiculous than others, but um, it's a very dangerous game to sort of get into that because um, it could be just as easily um, sort of um, thrown in our faces too. So we'll move on from that. Um, now, now that... None of what I'm saying actually negates the right of the land to the Jewish people. So, and does not re negate Zionism per se. So, like, um, the, the the scripture still stands. The rest of the rest of scripture still stands that Israel's right to the land is absolute, and it's unequivocal. But it does add complexity to the picture. That's what I've, I've been trying to sort of try and get across. Like, I think there's a complexity to the picture which we don't always appreciate. We are used to thinking of Israel's rights as absolute, and which it is, but also that they can do whatever they want without any other consideration. And, and Israel, of course, does not do whatever it wants. Israel does have a lot of consideration for the other people living there. Israel is given far more rights to, um, you know, the, 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 its minorities than any other Middle Eastern country. But um, it also should be understood that this, this has a biblical precedent. It's not just like the goodness of Israel. There is a biblical precedent to this. Even in the context of Israel's promised land, the other nations had rights. So if there was a nation that wanted to cleave to Israel, they had rights. And we know that the reason for the ethnic cleansing that was commanded originally was because of the sinfulness and idolatry of the surrounding nations for no, no other reason. And we, um, I guess I, I want to ask another question to, to us all. Of course, we know that most, you know, the vast majority of the Palestinians are, are Muslims. But if they were all Christians, if they were all born again, Bible believing, you know, Jesus um, believing, spiritually filled Christians, would our approach to this question be different? I'm going to say it again. If the Palestinians were all Christians and born again Christians, would our response be different? I would say yes. I think we would actually think of them um, quite differently. I think because um, I guess traditionally there's been a lot of animosity between Christianity and Islam. I think it's very easy to think of them as like this other, like the Jews and Christians as brothers and Muslims are sort of this other, which is sort of not really, you know, um, um, consistent with, especially, especially as pe people in the West, we're, we're obviously used to thinking of Islam um, and the cultures which involve Islam. Of course, Islam is, uh, is multicultural as well, but um, we're used to thinking of it as, as someone else, someone different. But if we, what if the question was that there were Christians? I think we'd have a different response anyway. We'll move on. But I just want us to have a think about that as well. And we'll go back to the slides if that's okay. Um, let's have a look. Now, I, I, my other question I had, which I won't dwell too much on, is would we, would we be so quick to defend Israel's actions or all of Israel's actions if um, all the Palestinians were our fellow believers? Now, as I've said before, Israel's rights to the land are biblically enshrined. There's nothing that can take it away. Uh, but 
I do think that sometimes what gets lost in the conversation is the rights of the you know, Palestinian Arabs, whatever you want to call them, as people. They are people, and they they um, you know obviously um, value their freedom, they value their civil rights, they value their property, and also yes, they value the rights um, to the land that they have bought and owned with their own money, and that's also enshrined in our scriptures too. So there's three main um, concepts which I think enshrine this idea. Um, obviously, all people are made in the image of God. All people deserve rights and, and protection. So I, I think, like, even though um, we as, um, as you know, the Jewish people do have a, a biblically um, enshrined promise to the land, we should respect the rights of all people because we are created in the image of God, but so are they. And also uh, just um, focusing on this idea is the idea of love your neighbor as yourself, the golden rule. Like, you know, if, if for example, us in Australia today, we were not the in indigenous inhabitants of, of Australia, but... I don't see the you know indigenous Australians trying to kick us out and trying to take our land that we've bought with our own money. So I think we should apply that same principle as well. Not that Israel does that, of course. I'm not saying that, but um, I think there is a tendency to sort of you know, especially the right wing um, tendencies are to um, you know just kick them all out. But I think if that was applied to any other land, we would you know think of that as a really terrible thing to do. And in the Messiah, of course, um, there is no Jew or Greek. Now that's not to say literally there's no Jew, no Gentile, but um, it means to say that we're all equal in the Messiah as well. So I do think you know, we should understand this. Now, I have not, uh, again, I want to reiterate this because I think people get the wrong idea. I'm not introducing this, these ideas to undermine Israel, but I'm only introducing this to bring balance. I think that's all I'm trying to do. Like, we need to have a balanced opinion and a balanced approach to all these difficult questions. Now, I'm not sure what the answers are. Like, I'm not sure whether the two-test solution is right or whether um, it should be one state or I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not a politician. But all I think we should do as believers is just have bring balance to the equation. That's all I think that um, the scripture is really telling us. Now, um, thankfully, like a lot of our leaders actually um, have a bit of balance. It's, it's the official position of the Israeli government. You actually, I've actually shared um, um, a quotation from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs web, um, website towards the end of, this, um, of the PowerPoint. But... Um, they actually um, say that they are at least publicly committed to the rights of, you know, I guess the non-Jewish um, minorities. Now, of course, um, with Bibi's government, there's uh, this question of annexation and et cetera, et cetera, which I won't get into, but um, that's the official position. And also, um, look, I don't think we'll have time today, so I'll get you guys to read it in your own time, but I've, I've shared two perspectives, um, which I've included on the slides. One of them is a... Um, is a um, very interesting essay I read this week. It's from a professor, Gerald R. McDermott. He's an American, I think Catholic actually. And he's um, he was speaking in October, 2018, and he was um, speaking at a Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. Now, the Christ at the Checkpoint Conferences are notoriously anti-Israel conferences. So I don't, I'm not actually endorsing the conference at all, but he actually gave a relatively pro-Israel opinion. So, and his opinion was actually very balanced. And one of the best you know, and most balanced um, sort of handlings of the conflict that I've read from a sort of Christian leader. So um, I, again, I was, I was planning to read these two perspectives with us today and just provide some commentary, but we don't have time. So I will end it here. I have provided links at the end of my PowerPoints to, um, to um, the sources for, my, um, for, for these discussions. So if you want to read them yourselves, I recommend doing so. I found it very interesting food for thought, but I've also quoted... Well, I think are the most relevant parts into my presentation. So, just for the sake of time, I will I, I won't go through um, the, um, the discussion today. I think it's, we're running out of time, so we'll finish the um, we'll finish the drush here. I hope that was interesting for for, for you all. Again, uh, none of what I'm saying is to undermine Israel, but I do think we need to have balance. And I think I do think that I mean, at least for me anyway, um, the, the thinking about and discussing Judges one to three has um, sort of challenged me in sort of how I approach my Zionism as well. And I hope it does for you, you all at home.